Do you know where I was last night? I was in Castle Ree, a town in Roscommon. I was in the Trinity Arts Centre for an evening about mental health. Now you might say, what was I doing at an evening about mental health and am I now the man that's not well myself? And you'd be right. But I reluctantly went to do it, you know, to, to speak about mental health because people said, well, stuff you write in the paper, stuff you write in the books, it's kind of all about mental health, and I suppose it is really. And when I talk about faith experience, when I talk about religion, I suppose I see it as mental health as well. So, last night I started off by reading a piece that I wrote a good few years ago now, eight or nine years ago, I think, and um, I'll read it for you. It's like um, I wrote it for a neighbour. A neighbour of mine died recently, after a few years of ill health. He was a quiet man who never married, but was good to the mother, and was cherished by nephews and nieces, and lived in a cosy house in the quiet hills above Loch Allen. I felt I knew him, although for more than twenty years we never spoke more than a few words. He farmed the fields all around our house, and he passed along the road every day. In November fog, he would drive past our front door, up the hills, with bales of hay sticking out of the boot of his Volkswagen, to feed the cattle that waited for him in the fields. He was a fine-looking man, thin and supple, with dark hair when we first met, though he had grown grey in recent years. The summer sun is full of sound, from the exquisitely booming bittern to the call of the curlew. But there was no sound as delicious as my neighbour's tractor in a field of grass. As he sat steering and twisting his head to watch the rake toss the mown grass into perfect lines behind him. And later the thump of hay bales being piled into the red galvanised shed where our cat moved in his wake as she hunted for field mice. He never allowed rushes to grow in his fields, and when he brought his cattle to lower ground for the winter, he closed every neighbour's gate on the way, so that there was no danger his cattle would intrude on someone else's land or green lawn. He drove slowly, his hand out the window, gently banging the outside of the car door to nudge the animals further down the lane. Animals that were as calm and quiet as himself. I often noticed how friendly the cows were as they stuck their heads over a fence like warm furry pets to be touched by a human hand. And like many rural men, he wasn't given to overexcitement. He'd raise one finger from the steering wheel to salute me. If I whispered my enthusiasm for the good weather as we passed, he might agree, but he would cautiously add, Will it last? I suppose nothing lasts forever. There's been much written about the brutality of rural life, but as someone who fled from middle-class Ireland long ago, to find refuge in the wild hills, I have to say that the wilderness has been for me a gentle place, and the tenderness and dedication of country people to their dogs and goats and cattle has often humbled me. When a farmer dies in the countryside, there is a strange emptiness in the fields. They grow ragged with rushes, and without paint the galvanised sheds turn to rust. 
although nothing rusted on my neighbour's land. I remember one summer evening when he had finished work, and the slope and grass had been shaved to its yellow roots. I saw him alone on the brow of a hill, his work done for the day. He was having one last look at the field, and the smoke from his cigarette dissolved in the air around his head. And I knew that he was well satisfied with his work, and proud of his land. The little church in Erigna was so full for his funeral that I couldn't get in, so I stood with dozens of other men outside a dry November day, with the slanting sun cutting into our faces as the coffin was shouldered towards the cemetery. People were there to witness the closure of a simple life to celebrate a quiet man who walked deeply on the earth and loved its colours. On my way home at night for twenty years, I would always pass his house and see lights on inside, and if I saw an extra car in the driveway, I knew his brother or sister was probably within, chatting at the range, and that he would never let go He'd never let them go without ladling them with vegetables from his abundant garden. But there will be no one to tend his garden now. And his fields are empty, his cattle taken away. His tractor will never come up again, up the hill on a summer's evening. And the house where there was always a light in the window at Christmas, will be dark forevermore. Those who live in the hills above Loch Allen have lost another solitary man. But all across the west of Ireland it is the same. One by one the lights go out. Well, I used that particular little story because the tragedy is that my neighbour was lost to suicide and I often feel you know when I look back was there a moment where you know when I'd go into the pub sometimes and he might be there having a drink and he'd be on his own and you'd say hello to him but I'd often wonder maybe if I had said a bit more. Would it have helped? And then when he'd be in the fields, you know, when he'd be when he'd be out there just working at the fields himself on his own, and I'd be in my little area at the house and I'd be looking over the fence. Maybe there was times that I could have made more conversation with him. I don't know. I suppose... I suppose one of the things about that is it's speculation. And I'm always saying that there's something inevitable about everything that happens. Like everything that happens has happened. And it does happen as it should happen because there's no other way it can happen. There's a kind of a... There's a slight kind of determinism, isn't there? A a slight kind of inevitability about this particular moment. You'd say it sometimes, sometimes you'd say, oh, sure, that was bound to happen. But in a sense, every moment is like that. Like, every moment happens out of necessity. It couldn't not happen. And yet, and and yet, when you're sitting in this moment, when you're sitting in this present moment, The future has not yet expressed itself. And so to some extent you may feel that you have the freedom of choice. You know, that even though everything that happened up to now is inevitable, the next thing that could happen is not inevitable. Particularly, it's clear to see it when you look at something like anger, when you look at something like a 
you know, you're getting really angry because it's some the other person is irritating you. And you come to a moment where you're about to say something appalling. You know, you're about to say something really vicious and wicked. And you're conscious. You're conscious of this kind of feeling in your gut. You're even conscious of the words in your head. But you still have a kind of freedom to say it or not say it. And the Islam has a lovely line, I suppose it could be Rumi, wherever I got it, but uh, your words are like arrows. Once they're released from the sling, you can never take them back. I I know I was talking about this last week. I I... I'm still talking about it because I think it's, God, in my life, that's so important. Like, it's so crucial as far as I'm concerned in my life, the way that if you can just find a non-violence in every moment, you know, in every single moment, you find this sort of passivity that you don't, you don't say the angry thing, right? And you don't even say the bitter thing. Like, Forgive me, I'm bending over here to, to fix the... I'm opening the fire there. God, I have a big... I have a lovely fire going. This is a wet owl Friday. Anyway, it's not just... It's not just holding back the violent statement, you know. Sometimes it's just a bitter statement. I I would feel personally very disillusioned at the moment with a whole lot of political issues. And... There's no point in going into them because I'm not going to start talking about them here because that would defeat the point they're making, which is which is trying not to say things. This used to happen to me years and years and years ago when I lived in Fermanagh and the troubles was going on all around me. Although sometimes I I really wanted to say things, you know. And and they were they were kind of cynical, bitter things. And if if you say them, it's almost like you bring that reality into existence. You know? There's something funny about that and I can't I can't quite explain it. I know there's a there's a Buddhist idea in you know, karma that they talk about the various forms of karma. There's what they call you know, there's a karma in your consciousness and then there's what they call a throwing karma. And then there's a sort of a landing karma. It's almost like your karma is is like a stone that you fling at somebody. So that there's three stages to fling in the stone. The the first stage is your conscious in your heart. That there's a stone and it would be nice to hit that person with it. Well, the second part is where you're actually throwing the stone at them. And the third part is where it's hitting them in the eye and taking out their sight or something. So those three levels are three levels of karmic action and each of them has a consequence. Obviously, if you threw a stone at somebody and it hit them in the eye and they were concussed, that's that's a huge karmic event and the consequences of it against you would be enormous. But even if you missed them, the very fact that you would throw the stone would constitute an enormous amount of rage and anger within you, expressed in your body. And the very fact of of letting that loose, even if you missed them, you've created a reality in the cosmos that is different from what it was a second earlier. You have, you know, you've allowed this anger to surface. And even the first one, even when you have in your heart the intention, like, I would love to throw a stone at that fecker. That has a consequence as well. Even within you. It's it's poisoning you. And... Now, 
And I dug me a little bell, isn't that nice? That's me Edwardian clock. And it wasn't making any sound for a couple of hours all morning. And I wound it up there, and that's the first little sound out of it. But anyway, I was talking about the sense of, of karma. It's like throwing a stone. And even if you never throw the stone, but it's like in your heart, I'd love to do it. it, it it's like a poison. It seeps through your body. It makes your body toxic. And so... So non-violence in that situation is is ensuring that the karmic energy never realises itself at any of those three levels. Certainly not hitting somebody, but not even trying to hit anybody. And not even having in your heart the intention to hit anybody. Now by hitting somebody with a stone, I just meaning it as a kind of a metaphor for anything negative you would want to do or to say to somebody else. Because as you know yourself, oh, there's there's words you can use and they're more cutting than a knife. You say them and they land and they hurt. And sometimes you do it because you know it will hurt. You actually do it verbally. And you know it will hurt. And you think you're taking pleasure out of it, but you're actually creating this karmic moment where the universe is changed utterly. It will never be the same, and you will never be the same. I know that's scary. It's not really, but it's kind of... You have to... You know, you you grow up to that sense of moral responsibility that, as they said, the only thing that you take out of this life is is your deeds, the consequences of your actions. Your your actions follow you like a shadow. So what you're going out of this life with is is the kind of consequences of all your dark karma if you're flinging stones all over the place. And I certainly know, and you know, that there's times when you say something to somebody and you intend to hurt them. It's like if it was a knife, you want to see the blood coming out from the wound. That's an instinct in us. Might be because there might be justifications for why we feel angry, why we want to lash out. Nonetheless, that's what happens. And so... In the teaching about karma, it's saying, obviously, you just don't do those things. It's not that you just don't physically throw stones, but you don't, like, even say things that will hurt in that way. And then, even if they weren't to actually reach the person, you might be just talking about them behind their back, and you might think, well, it gives me a little bit of pleasure to tell this person, you know, about some other person. You're talking in the third person. You're talking about somebody who's not present and you're indulging yourself in like talking about how bad they are. Or something bad that you know about them and you love sharing it because it's like, again, you're feeling that it's kind of, you're wounding them. And and it all comes back to having it in your heart. And it's one of the places where... You can't escape the amazing connection between the stories of Jesus and the Buddhist tradition, where he seems to be sometimes speaking like, not just like a Sufi, not just like a kind of a wisdom storyteller, but but really like a you know somebody who's read a lot of the the Buddhist texts about love and compassion. Turn the other cheek. Even lusting after somebody in your heart. They used to ridicule that when I was younger. It was one of those things came up again and again as, as a Christian idea that was silly. You know, that was kind of neurotic. Like, well, lusting after somebody in itself was seen as a bit repressive. 
we were living in the 70s, uh, liberated by Freud and all the psychoanalysis and, oh, you know, lust, sure, everybody lusts, it's good to lust. Um, and the Christian gospel was saying, well, well, you know, it's not good to lust, and even if you lust after somebody in your heart. And people would be saying, well, them Christians are crazy, you know, neurotic. But I, I think now, now that we've had a, a bigger influence from Buddhist philosophy in the West, peop- and also from psychoanalysis, there's a, there's a bigger recognition now that lusting is desiring, lusting is wanting to possess. You know, lusting is not the joy of sex, the union of you and the beloved in wonderful, sensual joy. No, lusting is like, I want that person. And so that even in your heart, of course, is is like throwing the stone in your heart. If it's in your heart to do the negative deed, then you're already halfway down the slippery slope to hell. You might say, okay, what's hell? If you think about it, you'll know it. You'll recognize it. We've all been in hell 13, 14 times in a lifetime. It's a place where you're disconnected and you feel you feel just sour and bad in yourself. And one of the things I was talking about last night, I was trying to make a a little, you know, presentation about my own mental health. And those were the kind of things that I was talking about because because for me my mental health is based on three levels of connectivity. Am I connected well with the people around me? My family, my neighbours, my friends, and then the wider public. Is my instinct, do I feel I can smile when I meet someone? Ask yourself that, and it's an interesting question. Sometimes you realize that even with a loved one, might be a mother or a sibling, you realize you you don't naturally just smile, open your face and smile the minute you see them. Quite the opposite sometimes. To me, do I smile when I meet you? I'm smiling now. Well, that's good. That makes me feel... That makes me feel I'm in right relationship with you. And I'll let you into a secret. Sometimes I do it with a stranger, even though I'm nervous that smiling is maybe the wrong idea, maybe the wrong way to go, maybe I should be cautious. And sometimes when I'm going to a stranger, it might be at a reception desk or in an office or in a hotel or somewhere, and I'm doing business and I'm walking up to somebody and I'm feeling nervous and my me, me face wants to hold on to a kind of a nervous disposition and sometimes I'd force myself to smile. I would just stop and be present and think, here's another human being. Isn't that in itself amazing? Is, isn't it wonderful that I am now about to encounter another human being? And I'd smile, and always I'd find the other person person smiles. And you're off to a good start. You might be doing business in the bank or in the post office. You might be in a restaurant. You might be just nodding at somebody on a bus. And a little smile. It's not false, you know. You, you, the minute you smile at somebody, you, you'll kind of hear, it's like you'll hear a music inside in yourself coming out, exuding out of you. And you'll see in the other person's face that they can recognize the music. So if I have a right relationship with other people around me, then I feel healthy. And that that brings me out of 
if if there's ever a danger of me getting into depression, and I've I've mentioned this a good few times because I was down in that pit of darkness in 2011 and 2012, and thanks be to God I got out of it. But I got out of it because people loved me and, and drew me out of it. You know, people smiled at me. People resonated something to me that felt like love, felt like encouragement, felt like come out of the darkness and experience the light. So that kind of right relationship with other people is is, is powerful. And I found that even at times when I would be on my own, and there are times because I like being on my own, I like solitude, and sometimes you'd go into a solitary place. I'd go away to write, for example. I was away for two weeks there in Donegal, and I was writing away, and I had the head down, and I was in the room, and then the house on my own, just working away. And sometimes then, after a couple of days or good few hours in the morning right, writing at the type at the, the screen, you'd go out to the shops and you'd be living in your head, you know, you'd be in your own head. And then what'd be worse is you'd turn on the news and you'd start getting all the argumentative negativity of the politics and the global stories about wars and that would all get into your head and it would feed into a kind of a a terrible sense of despondency and negativity. And I'd be on my own. And what I do in that situation is I go down the town, I go into the village closest to me, I go to the, you know, the, the petrol station. And there might be just one person behind the counter. And I catch their attention, I eyeball them. And I have me few little things there, you know, going through on the conveyor belt. And I say, it's a nice day. Or something. It's a wet day, whatever. And I get a response that's human. And I walk out of that supermarket a happy man. I go into it, maybe a lonely man. I come out of it a happy man. Because of 20 second engagement with another human being. That's how rich human encounter is. Every human encounter is so rich. So that's right relationship with other people. And the other place that I find I need right relationship with is with myself. So, so that there's not a disconnect with myself. Now, one of the best ways to test that, I suppose, is through meditation. And I don't mean now doing a whole big job of meditation. You're going along in the car, you're walking along in the street. Get rid of your headphones, earphones. Get rid of all the sort of narratives that come into you from technology and from digital sources. And you're just there walking along and you're experiencing yourself in your body and you're experiencing your breath, and and you're feeling okay, just just okay. No big deal of ideas in your head, but you're just feeling okay. You're becoming aware of your body. You're becoming aware, I suppose, of the equilibrium of just being. And if 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 I'm not in right relationship with myself, if and I'm speaking about me because this is how it used to happen to me. When I suffered from depression, it was like there was a negative voice in my head 24-7. The voice was my voice, but it seemed like someone else's. It seemed like a demon. It seemed like Dracula. It seemed like somebody was trying to destroy me. And everything I would do, I might be washing the dishes. I might be making the bed. And I'd always do it wrong. I might be holding my phone in my hand and it would fall out of my hand and nearly break on the floor. And every time I'd have this tormenting voice telling me, I'm doing everything wrong. 
And that would be in small things. What's that like when you come to, you know, big, big tasks, like putting your life together and going down the street and chatting to strangers, always this voice in your head being negative. And I think that's why when I was depressed, I ended up very much isolated. I would, I'd, I would lie in the bed all day. I didn't want to come out of the bedroom. Didn't want to come out of the bed. So it's like, it's like this terrible negative voice. You can't stop it. And I would say that that is a massive example of, of depression. And I think the way out of that is through therapy and talking to people in a therapeutic way. Being affirmed. Having close people around you who, who affirm you. And so, so this might affect you because you might not necessarily be ever affected by depression, but you might know somebody who is. And so the way this conversation might affect you is think about how powerful and helpful you are to somebody who, who experiences depression by affirming them, by saying something positive to them. You know, you could use the phone. You could phone somebody up. I, I immediately think of somebody. I immediately know that if there's one person in my life, I know that they would be very often kind of in low form, in, in sort of half depressed and melancholic. If I picked up the phone after this podcast and rang that person up and said, how are you doing? And good to hear you. And it's great to hear your voice. And affirm them. Even if you didn't want to use your own voice on the phone, it's amazing how sending a text to somebody who might be isolated, might be lonely, might be feeling negative about themselves, and you send them a text, and it's like you're affirming them. So beautiful. And that, that would bring me to, to be honest with you, to another point that has come up for me recently and I feel really excited about it and it is this I wrote a book one time called What is Beautiful in the Sky I wrote it during Covid and everybody was feeling negative and everybody was feeling stressed and it was like Covid is a terrible thing and it was and I thought the only way I will get through Covid is to think about what is beautiful in the world and the older I get and the more I see of, you know, we'll say films and narratives about who we are as a species, some of them are so negative that I feel there's an almost an obligation on me to be positive. Almost an obligation as a storyteller to try and be able to say what is beautiful. I know that there's a therapy that, you know, people who are alcoholic use when they have, you know, they've dried out and they'd still say they're alcoholic, but they don't drink for maybe months or years or whatever. And they might get up every morning and give themselves, as a kind of morning ritual, give themselves five things to be grateful about. It's such a powerful exercise, such a powerful yoga of the mind. Very small things to be grateful. So, so the disconnect where I'm not feeling good about my relationship with other people or I'm not feeling good about my relationship with myself. There are two ways that I think I experienced depression. And the third way, because the first two I feel that I sorted out by having a loving family who affirmed me and then by going to a therapist and dealing with, 
you know, various ways in which I was feeling negative about my own self. I'm working through and becoming conscious and aware of, of sort of habitual patterns of thinking, negative thinking about myself that, that I was using all the time, repeating, you know, you're stupid. It's like, it's like, it's like you get a, a script for life when you're young and, and my script is, you're stupid. And so when things go wrong, this, this script emerges and I start using it. You're stupid. I'm talking to myself as if I was a third person, you know. You are stupid. No, a second person. You are stupid. Being very destructive, you know, very negative to yourself. When you hear somebody else doing it, it's really heartbreaking. It's really heartbreaking to hear somebody being negative to themselves. And you'll hear it sometimes from young people, and it makes me nearly cry. You know, where a young person, you're talking to them and they start talking about, in a negative way, about their, their own self. So there's two ways of disconnecting and two ways of, of remedying it. And the third way, as you know, the third way for me happened in around 2016 when I began to look at the fact that I had been engaged with Buddhist philosophy for nearly 20 years at that stage and that I'd previously been ordained as a priest which mattered to me more than anything. And in that one moment I realised that my faith is part of my health. It's part of my well-being. To use the mentor deity that I am attached to, which would be Christ or Buddha, doesn't matter who it is in any religion, the mentor deity, the, the one who you focus on as the perfection of the universal conscious cosmic energy, the one who's, who's drawing you through every moment into bliss. The one who holds you and carries you like a mother in her womb every second of every day and every night when you're asleep. That beautiful sense of relationship with, with the God, I realised at a certain point. I'd been doing it all my life, but I realised it's part of my mental health. It's actually, it's actually the same as the wellness stuff. It's the same as the therapy. So I'm going to Mass or I'm going to, you know, uh, do a puja in some Buddhist centre, but it's having a therapeutic effect on me. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling lighter in myself. I'm feeling just more joyful. I'm feeling more optimistic. And, and then I feel in right relationship with the kind of mystery of, of existence. So I'm not feeling alienated from the world. I'm not feeling, well, the world ultimately is a terrible place. And I'm not even feeling as, as scared about dying. When I just think of myself as an existential alienated creature who was alone and kind of just fumbling through life without meaning, then, then death and annihilation seems like an appalling completion. But if, if I feel that I belong in the arms of Mary, or that the, that the risen cosmic Christ is present in every molecule and atom of the universe that is touching me as the wind touches my face, caressing me, caring for me, knowing me like 
from I was in the womb. Then, then this which is beyond the veil of, of surface reality will, will draw me in death. And so my annihilation in death is no longer annihilation, but is the final completion of union with the Godhead. I dissolve into that beautiful, enlightened peace. As they used to say, the light of heaven. The light of heaven be upon him. So, so that's the way that, that, that the right relationship, you know, with other people helps me. The right relationship with, with myself helps me, not to be negative about myself. And the right relationship with, with some kind of mentor deity, some kind of God. There are different religions which is kind of wonderful because you might, you might sort of say that Human beings are so different, there are so many, there's seven or eight billion. They're so vastly different that it's no wonder that we have different methods of expressing this relationship with God. And no matter how my culture alienates me from it and tells me that it's irrelevant, and, and invites me to live a secular life, a kind of a, a life of materialism. I resisted. Not for philosophical reasons, but because I know that having that sense of faith is good for my mental health. It makes me feel good. I'll just I'll just say one more thing if you don't mind and that is to do with faith. Faith they always say is a gift. It's like you don't have faith but you can act as if you have faith and then faith awakens in you and it's like you didn't put it there. It's not in your gift to have faith in God. It's God that gives you faith in God. So even your faith is an experience of God's gift. The way to think about that is to, is to think about every sinew of your being, every molecule of your body and, and your, 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 your consciousness, your mind, everything that that is shaped into who you are in this moment, right? Is inevitable in the way that I said at the beginning of this podcast. You know, it's it's determined that you should be here now with the body you have, the face you have, the mind you have. It was inevitable that this moment would come. You, you contributed nothing to it. Being you in this moment is something that you had no hand act or part in. It simply evolved into this moment where you suddenly find yourself here. You find yourself here with the wonderful and amazing possibility that the future has not yet happened. And so there may be a determinism that says every moment when it happens was inevitable, but what's not yet happened has not yet happened. And when you become non-violent or passive, you're responding to whatever arises in the next moment, rather than trying to create a narrative in the next moment. You're not trying to make history, you're just in the eternal present, responding to whatever rises up. And in that sense, it's like 
your attitude to that is the faith. Your sense of responding to the mystery of what happens next is faith. I always leave a space for the chimes of my clock. And when I hear the clock, it calls me to pay attention to the present moment. And when I'm in that present moment, I'm saying to you in this particular podcast, I'm saying that respond Pay attention to the world around you. Pay attention to the people around you. Just respond. Don't try and create anything. This, you might say, is is a massive argument for sitting at a fire and doing nothing all day. And you might be right. I I think dozing is a great idea. I'm sitting here now. The fire is, is just really warm. A stove. I have two wet shoes that I was using this morning outside. I was I was pruning bushes and things. And the shoes are drying and I've had a bit of exercise. And the fire is just right now and I'm going to rest at it when I'm finished this podcast. I'm gonna rest there now for a half an hour or an hour. I'm going to pay attention to the trees outside, which are beginning, beginning to show little buds. The gorse, the whins bushes are yellow. The mountain is so beautiful in its remote distance at the other side of the lake. Maybe the cat will come to the window. Maybe I'll hear bird song, I don't know, but I will respond to the moment. I will be aware of it, and I will be grateful that I am present. And what I'm saying, I suppose, is that for me that's faith. There's only so far you can go with words. Rumi says, Words will take you to the door, but they will not take you into the house. That's stepping over into a way of experiencing your life as a life of faith. Life of faith. So beautiful. And you say, well, how do I do that? Just be present. But don't try and create a narrative. Don't, don't try and sort of create history. Just be present to everything. And you'll realize you're not alone. You can see how that's so good for your health. You know, if, if I, I talk about, it was a really deep experience for me to realize that not just was I attached to being a Christian or a Buddhist, but when darkness came and when depression came, I realized that my religion, my faith practice, was a massive addition for my mental health to bring me through the difficult times. And it's about coming through difficult times. It's finding the light in the darkness.
There's so much around us at the moment in Europe, in the world. So many wars. So much violence. So much argument. And sometimes you can get weary of it. And I hope that this sharing with you sustains you in your journey to be positive and to live this sense of response to the whole cosmos and to be in relationship with your God. Because I've no doubt that your presence helps me and sustains me in that way. I've no doubt about it. I mean, am I doing this podcast for your benefit? No, I'm doing it for my benefit. And I don't mean the financial benefit, although I do really appreciate every five euros per month that somebody gives me by going on Patreon. Yeah, I do. But no, no, I mean it that for my benefit, in my soul, in my in my, my way of being in the world. You are blessing me because you're drawing out of me a sense of being positive, a sense of hope, a sense of belief in God. You're, you're drawing that out of me because I'm saying it for you. So it's a journey together. And thank you for being here.